Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Retail Media in 2024. If you didn't catch my special fireside chat with Roundell earlier today, let me introduce myself. I'm Andrew Lipsman. I'm a VP and Principal Analyst at Insider Intelligence. Now, in the next 35 minutes, we're going to be digging even deeper into retail media along with my special guests. So joining me today are Emily Frankel, Senior Vice President and Head of E-Commerce Marketing at PepsiCo, Francesca Hahn, Vice President, U.S. Digital Commerce at Mondelez International, and Paris Shah, Director of Digital Marketing at Georgia Pacific. But now, before we begin, let us know where you're tuning in from, and I'd like for you in the audience to weigh in on this in the chat. So Kara Pratt, who is the head of Kroger Precision Marketing, likes to say that retail media is media. Do you agree or disagree? Drop in a thumbs up or a thumbs down and let us know. So with that, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the panel. All right, so I'm gonna kick it off to the group. Uh, we just asked the question to everyone in the audience, uh, Kara Pratt's uh, aphorism about retail media being media. Um, I'd like to pull the room to kick us off. Uh, what's your thought? Do you di agree or disagree with that statement? I'm happy to jump in here. Um, you know, I think at a minimum, retail media should be media. Uh, I think it has the opportunity to be, to be so much more than just media, though, because it does give the added benefit of connectivity and visibility to the point of sale. Uh, but I think if there aren't basic media capabilities, targeting, measurement, um, then it just becomes strategic investment with a retailer. But I wouldn't classify it as media in that case. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, Emily, I mean, I agree retail media is media because it, it, it encompasses a lot of the various just advertising and promotional activities within the retail setting. And it also plays a very significant role in engaging consumers during their omnichannel shopping journey. But at the same time, for retail media to be media, it needs to be evaluated in the same way that you evaluate media and not look at it as a strategic investment. I think we're all on the same page here. Uh, I, I also think retail media is media. I, I really think the traditional funnel has fully collapsed at this point. So we do have to look at it in all different ways. I mean, at this point, traditional media has got QR codes on and driving to retailers at this point. So to, you know, to the points of, of both everyone else here that I do agree as well. Okay, so there's broad consensus, retail media is media. Um, so I'd like to, to move on in the conversation um, to, to dig in a bit more on what CPG brands like yourself uh, are looking for from retail media networks. Now, um, we just completed a study on our CPG retail media network benchmark report this year, and um, we got some really interesting insights from brands. But one of the things that you know I, I think we saw across the different retail media networks is that they're doing a pretty good job, but there's also room for improvement in different areas. So I'm curious to get your perspective, and I'm going to frame this as a multiple choice question. Um, what is the most important thing that retailers can do to support your further investment in retail media networks? Um, and the choices in this one are, one, to improve search ad performance um, via things like implementing a second price auction or algorithmic improvements. The second option is to use transparent and standardized metrics. And the third option is to deliver credible incrementality um, or IROAS metrics. Uh, let's let's do this one as a round robin. Andrew, I'll start. I'm going to go with D, all of the above. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I would say it is all of the above, but I'd say different priority orders. It's most important to start with um, just driving or delivering credible incrementality metrics. Um, you know, a lot because retail media is media and the role of media is to drive incrementality for your business. You know, we want to make sure that the retail media is focused on driving incrementality, but then transparency and st standardized metrics are very critical too. And as we think about investments going into non search tactics, where metrics such as the viewability for on site media and off site media are critical, I think that it's also very important for us to think about the transparency and the standardized metrics so that we can look at everything on an apples to apples uh, basis as well. And, you know, with the bulk of retail media investment being in search today anyways. It's just, it's always important to try to improve that performance too. And I'll add that I believe that the number one thing is the site needs to work effectively and efficiently for shoppers. So if that doesn't work first fundamentally, then 
retail media is it becomes a leaky bucket in a sense. Uh, you've got to make sure that the site is easy to find, learn, buy, fulfill the products. And so if that's not easy, then then you're just putting money on top of something that's going to go out the bottom. And then to, you know, to all the other points, I 100% agree that from a retail media perspective, then is that actually working as hard as it can for us on top of a nice and effective website? And I, I have to agree. And, and you, you uh, we're on the same page of the D, all of the above, because I really think when it comes to retail media, it's not even about one specific tactic or getting too narrow. I think where we start to really benefit with retail media investments is the ability to start to connect the dots, to connect multiple exposures, to understand how our investment, how our messaging, how our strategies and campaigns really le uh, link together to engage shoppers over a period of time, because the reality is it's not just flash, flash in a pen, there's ongoing engagement and our investment needs to help to persuade and help to drive incrementality in the business and help to guide shoppers to, um, you know, to help inform their purchases or guide their purchases. And I think that's why, that's why we invest. I think, Francesca, to your point, like, we want our dollars to change behavior, not to supplement the way that a site, you know, basic functionality should work anyway. And I'll add also that the retail media and the e-commerce team and the merge team are all talking together and aligned at the same point. So that also makes everything rise higher and effective. I love this point that, that uh, a few of you are making about customer experience being central to this, right? It's a great reminder. I think that all of this marketing and advertising opportunity that has emerged it doesn't really exist if you don't get the CX correct first, right? It's at the end of the day, it is about driving customer behavior and you have to make that as uh, simple as possible. Um, now, according to our latest ad spend forecast, retail media is expected to grow from about $45 billion this year in the U S to 110 billion by 2027. Um, there has been a lot of conversation across the industry. I hear it every time I go to an event um, where do the budgets come from, right? That's a lot of new spend coming into this channel. Um, so I, I'm curious to hear from all of you. You're the ones that control the budgets. Um, you know, yes, this happens over a number of years, but ultimately, where do you see those budgets coming from? Um, and, you know, how much do you think is going to be maybe new spend or incremental versus, you know, moving around of existing spend? So, I mean, no I, one jump out at once. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can start. I mean, I'll, I'll kind of give my point of view. Like, you know, with, with CPGs, I would say that retail media networks, they've mostly exhausted trade spend, merger accruals, and shopper marketing investments. And while there is a role for national media within a national media plan, the asks from the retailers are growing at a faster rate than the media investment growth of CPGs. And knowing that CPGs, you know, we're going to make investments based on our marketing objectives. There may be media partners outside of retail media networks that make more sense than the actual retail, retail media network, or some of the retail media networks may make more sense than external partners. So, you know, we're going to de determine where we make the investment based on the objectives, but I would say only so much growth can come from existing CPGs. So my point of view is I actually expect a lot of the retail media growth from that 45 billion to 110 billion coming from non-endemic advertisers. I think also there's a question of what are the tactics? I think something that happens with retail media, retail media is an umbrella term, but there's so many different components of what actually makes up retail media. So whether it's paid search, is it owned and operated inventory? Is it leveraging retailer data to buy offsite? And I think it's hard to say that the funds will come from, from one place. I think each of these separate tactics has the opportunity uh, to you know, ba again, based on objective, to say what are we where do the trade offs happen based on what we're you what you're trying to achieve with the media? Because I would expect an incremental or a dollar to shift from brand media being different than saying I'm going to shift a dollar that's intended to build brand equity and try to try to shift that and say well this has to be a search marketing dollar. Those feel like two very different things, and I think can be held as kind of separate conversations. Well, that that's a great point. So let's uh, unpack this a little bit more. So search. Um, according to our forecasts, uh, next year, the incremental growth that's going into retail media, 
60% of, of that incremental growth is still going to come from search. Uh, but you're also mentioning some other touch points like offsite media. We can talk about uh, some of these things as well. You know, those are going to be, you know, 15, 20% uh, chunks of, of what comes next. Um, but let's, let's dig in a little bit on search. Um, I think brands are still kind of funneling in this direction um, because at least there's a tight link between the ad exposure and performance. So I'm curious to get your perspective. What do you see being the major improvements or value unlocks that the RMNs, you know, e-commerce websites and apps uh, can do to actually make a brand spend more and invest more? I'll start. I, I think I think if the tools and the fundamentals will always I'll always start with that first. Uh, there are certain capabilities that certain retail media networks have that allow you to make sure that your money is leveraged as efficiently as possible. Um, some things just like negative keywords, um, something you call mirroring. We're trying to avoid buying where your product would show up automatically. If not, you have you have to put a lot of resources to manually ensure that your money's being leveraged well. So I think that's the one thing is making sure that the fundamental is clean. And then, um, you know, finding the right spots that we can choose from, from an inventory perspective, where the product is going to be most effective based on what you're trying to achieve, what your objectives is. So I'd call it objective based buying in a sense. Um, is it really just truly going after incremental or are you trying to promote a new item? Are you trying to get awareness, you know, based on, you know, again, what your objective is to accomplish? And I think there's an element of granularity that for search uh, makes a lot of sense and to not be afraid of scale of campaign size that actually when you're going to find efficiencies, getting very granular, having targeting, whether it is on you know, I think keyword kind of sometimes seems to scratch the surface with negative keyword targeting, which feels like it should be table stakes. But I think when it comes to granularity, really being able to say, how do I set up campaigns that mirror my business and my business priorities? And that might be different by organization. But to say, you know, there are certain types of internal economics that I want to reflect in my campaign structure, for instance. And are we able to do that? Can we have that type of sophisticated structure? And I think the other direction that I haven't seen yet and would love to see is more around audience targeting within search. Because I feel like outside of the retail environment and in a, in a Google search environment, for instance, the ability to do audience targeting across media tactics um, has been around for a while. And I think that that's something that could be interesting in a retail search environment because um, you know knowing whether somebody has purchased your product in that platform or in that channel before we would expect there to be potentially different interest invest in investment in acquiring versus retaining and I think both have value but I I don't think um, you know just having to to sit through average you know just to use averages is necessarily beneficial. And it may depend on the moment, right? There might be times where you really do want to acquire those new customers and other times where you got to move the sales needle. Yeah. Um, so let, let me ask them what uh, we, we talked about, what retailers and RMNs can do to maybe, uh, you know, complete their, their suite or their capabilities from a search perspective. What are you as the brand focusing on doing in terms of your execution of paid search strategies so that you can unlock uh, you know, more effectiveness or efficiency in, in your investment. I'm happy to, I'm happy to chime in. I think it's, you know, exactly as I was saying, it's about, for us, it's about granularity, right? It's about getting very specific to what are the objectives. And, and Andrew, I think to your point about sometimes you are looking to drive incrementality or drive acquisition. And in other cases, you're looking to, um, to just, you know, drive the top line. I think that that's, I think that that's okay. I think being very intentional about how we spend the dollars and um, understanding and outlining at the outset, what are the core objectives of spend and starting with the consumers? What, what is the engagement of consumers with our brands on these, on these platforms and then uh, structuring our campaigns in order to support that? I'd say we're doing a lot of democratizing and capability building on retail media within the organization so that the the people that are sales and also marketing and even you know some some other interesting functions are feeling and understanding how it works 
what you can do with it, uh, you know, from, it can be very empowering capability that, but some people don't understand still, it's still a relatively new um, piece of, of how we can activate. So, so that's is, a big is the thing idea us. there that if you know, everybody, you have so, so many different brands that if you have all the stakeholders involved, that they can tap into their knowledge to say, oh, we know this is a driver of brand purchase. Maybe we need to tweak the strategy that way. Is that mm -hmm. the idea? Somewhat. Uh, first of all, I just it's at this point, it's gotten too big to just have a few people that understand. Uh, so, you know, decision makers, the people that own budgets should understand what you can do and what you can get out of it. If they're making decisions on media, they should understand retail media. If they're they're making decisions on displays in store, they should understand retail media and how they can activate at the same point. So that's the thinking. So I'm hearing search, yeah. search has gotten big enough that it needs to be decentralized at this point. Um, Paras, I think you had something to say. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, we're focused on just, uh, continuing to educate all, you know, uh, functions within the organization around retail media, search especially, just, you know, as you, you mentioned, Francesca. And then from there, it comes back to what is the objective we're trying to accomplish, you know, uh, by a uh, retailer and making sure that the objective that needs to be addressed can be done with paid search. You know, every paid search platform is different by a retailer just about. And knowing that there's differences in the capabilities, you know, to Emily's point around the granularity of what can be accomplished as well, making sure that as we kind of, you know, decomp each platform, it can ladder back up to the, you know, overarching objectives of the customer or of that, or of that account at the retailer. Because if you're able to make that connection back, then I think it, you know, makes sense to continue to drive improvements and how we can execute those strategies. But in some cases, it may not make as much sense because of, you know, the objectives that the merchant has laid out or that, you know, uh, or that our uh, account team has laid out um, at that specific customer. So we kind of look at it from the objectives all the way down to the capabilities and determine uh, what improvements need to be made at a local level. And I think so that point about the, oh, go ahead, Andrew. No, please jump in. I was going to say your point about about the merchants too. Given you know as as endemic advertisers versus non endemic advertisers, which I think creates a, a different dynamic when you are an endemic advertiser in a retail media environment. Collaboration with sales teams and understanding them what's driving from a merchant perspective, I think, is really important. It's not a bad it's not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing because you really then can get you really can get very clear on aligning on objectives, aligning on the, the role and the purpose of what you're trying to achieve and then adjust. And I think search is such a great lever, but it can be used in so many different ways that that alignment's critical. Like marketing can't invest in search in a, in a vacuum, or if they do, I think it leaves opportunity. Yep. So a few of you have, have mentioned uh, the magic word in, in CPG, incrementality. Um, I, I will say in virtually every room in which uh, RMN folks, particularly CPGs, are involved, uh, the words incrementality or IROAS um, are weirdly, you know, the, the top reference terms. It is that important, it seems like. Um, so I'd love to get your perspective. Um, how focused are you on IROAS as that, you know, primary metric? Um, do you have preferred methodological approaches for, for IROAS? Like, how, how are you thinking about this and how much do you want to standardize your metrics or your thinking around that metric? Yeah, so Georgia Pacific, incrementality is critical to measuring effectiveness. And like, you know, we're very squarely focused on just the incrementality of our media and helping us achieve our brand objectives. So everything we do in retail media, as we do in just media, going back to Kira Pratt's quote, is focused around the incrementality that it drives for our business. And so from a methodology standpoint, you know, we prefer to look at uh, or look at Calpe IROAS in a test versus control, you know, based on exposed versus unexposed. But with just the lack of standardization in the retail media marketplace on the control cell specifically, we actually try to spend time with, you know, our advanced analytics teams reviewing each retail media network's control methodology to determine if we support their measurement analysis or if we have challenges to their approach. And I think where it gets tricky with lacking standardization is then trying to compare across retailers. Because I think, you know, regardless of the methodology, if it's consistent within a retailer, you can use relative measurement to have an understanding of are you moving in the right direction or do you feel like your campaigns are moving in the right direction. But I think where lack of standardization becomes really challenging 
is when you try to compare across retailers, we can't necessarily use reports that come out of an individual system of the, the retailer graded uh, incrementality assessment. Um, and then it falls on us as, as a company to kind of build our own measurement systems that put everybody as much as possible on equal playing field, but that's challenging to do. And I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm in the same camp and uh, it's interesting when I see IROAS or even ROAS, it's interesting in sense of comparing against one retailer, you know, or one retail media network, but it's not helpful, uh, it, you know, ultimately on making bigger decisions. So you've got to do your own advanced analytics work, unfortunately. I like yeah. the work that IAB is doing right now in terms of trying to standardize. So I'm a big fan of that effort. And, um, you know, if anyone's not into into those details, get into it, because uh, I think that path is is really good for the industry. Yeah, it, it, it really is important work. And um, I've anytime you try and get a lot of diverse constituents uh, agreeing on things, it's difficult. It is it's the ultimate cat herding exercise, but I've heard it described as the fastest cat herding that people have ever seen, which I think uh, shows <laughs> that everybody's committed to, to advancing the cause here. But the point you're making uh, about standardization is so critical here, which is that in one sense, just moving from ROAS to IROAS is a huge step in the right direction. And anybody who's spent time around these methodologies, they're all imperfect, um, but it's it's better than the alternative in one sense until you get to trying to cross compare. And as you said, what's IROAS in, in one platform will be very different. And so you can't even look at those metrics um, in a similar fashion. So, um, one of the other uh, evolutions that's starting to happen is with offline attribution. Um, you know, in the early era of, of retail media, it's an online ad that drives an online or e-commerce sale. But as we all know, and, and certainly in CPG, you know, 90% of sales roughly are happening in stores. Um, how are you thinking about offline attribution for your retail media investments and um, are you getting what you need from the RMNs? I've, I've heard that you know a lot of the solutions in terms of closing that loop to offline are in various uh, phases of, of evolution. So um, where is it at today and, and how are you thinking about it? I'd agree it varies by retailer. I think it I think the intent and the desire to be able to show a complete picture is there, but I think it's it is in kind of very varying degrees across retailers to have that complete picture. And I think um, some of it again goes back to goes back to tactics or expectations of the type of media. And I think when we get into offsite media and try to to measure the impact of offsite media, there's also the question of the what is the message to consumers? Is this a message that you're just your core brand message? Is it a co-branded message with the retailer? Some of that becomes expectations. Um, you can, we can measure it with similar methodology of, as to any media, right? To try to understand holistically, are we driving sales lift in a retailer agnostic way? Um, and I think it's unrealistic to expect that just because you're, you're using a retailer's data to, uh, to show an ad to a consumer, if it's not a co-branded message, to say that you're going to drive additional retailer share, you know, with that asset, that's a pretty big leap versus kind of fair share um, from a consumer perspective. Um, but I do think I think there's work to be done to truly connect the dots, and I think some of that complete picture is because there's separate ecosystems by retailer. And so to get the full picture of how we're impacting offline sales, particularly in a retailer agnostic way, we need to be able to connect the dots from consumer to retail, you know, to sales anywhere. And I think there's there are efforts underway and some really interesting efforts underway to show that complete picture. But I think that's still a pretty big challenge, especially with data privacy and who owns that consumer ID. Yeah. Well, why don't we jump jump ahead? This is leads into the next question, which is, um, as a brand, you know, if you're working with a particular RMN, you're seeing the sales through the closed loop, even if they're giving you everything that you're asking for an offline attribution, um, just within the four walls of that retailer, right? But there's this rest of market effect that that media can be driving sales, particularly upper funnel media can be driving sales um, in, in other retailers. People don't always, only shop at that retailer. And in fact, uh, Circana recently gave me some interesting data that showed 
that the retail media campaigns they were looking at, there's an additional 25 to 35% additional impact that happens with these retail campaigns outside of that retailer. Um, so I'm curious to hear more. Are, is that how, like in your worldview, is that how you want to see it? Is that how you want, want to understand performance? So I was going to, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. That's fine. I would say we've historically, we focus on how retail media <clears throat> drive sales at that particular retailer because the value that the retailer brings to the table is a first party data, right? And it's, and because it's first party data about the purchasing habits, you know, at that specific retailer, we want to make sure that we're able to drive some of that local volume. But, you know, knowing that cookie deprecation is actually on the horizon and the first party data will be more important in the future, we started to evaluate the rest of market impact, you know, for the media by leveraging just third-party measurement solutions. Um, and so we're starting to evolve our thinking around this you know, beyond just the impact of the, um, at that specific retailer to how we read in you know in our media mix model, like what impact this has on the marketplace. Let's look at third-party measurement solutions, you know, like a Serpana to understand what kind of impact does this media have across the entire marketplace. So we can start to evolve our POV on this front as well. That's I'm not a very proposition, right? Uh, sorry, really quickly, it's not either or proposition between these two things, right? You can leverage what's right. unique, the unique data within that RMN to maximize the impact there. And right. also you want to understand the holistic impact. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very interested in on what, you know, what happens when we're running um, any kind of media in the market. And, you know, we're using marketing mix analysis, other advanced analytics type systems to understand halo effect. Um, but the halo, the the holy grail for me is digitally influenced sales measurement over time, um, and uh, I think that's some interesting thinking on models on how to do that. Uh, a little bit to Emily's comment earlier about how you bring in consumer data and you know touch points as well into the thinking because I want to be able to link it all together, everything that we've done, and, and understand which ones because we've seen some Forrester research, some other research. Maybe there's some insider intelligence research on this, but this digitally influenced sales is really important to us. Yeah, well, and you're I bringing up a great point about over time as well, the lifetime value, particularly in, in your category. Um, so I know we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit because we haven't even solved offline attribution yet, but um, but lifetime value, right? This is where, where the real value can stack up. Um, I actually just uh, shared some research at a, at a conference recently um, looking at product sampling in CPG and how that, uh, basically how the IROAS piece of it, the incremental sales for the people who hadn't bought that brand previously at the retailer, um, it was about uh, four times higher if you looked at the, at the, the IROAS after 28 days versus at the end of the year, right? So if you take that light, that that full view, people sampled it, they tried it, and then they were buying it uh, on incremental occasions into the future, all of a sudden the ROAS picture gets very different. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm I'm curious, is, is that sort of where your mind is going? Is this how you think about it? Is that how you want to understand and truly capture value of incrementality? That's something that I definitely take into consideration. And I think um, frequency of purchase is so important, particularly in, in a food and beverage category. So when we think about investment, um, in acquiring a, a customer, acquiring a consumer, the hope and the intent is that they become a frequent buyer of our products. And so I think we sell ourselves short a little bit if we're judging the effectiveness of media investment just by did they buy one time, because we know for sure that um, if uh, if they're enjoying our products, that there's there's a low barrier for for repeat and for high frequency, and so I think having that more holistic picture um, allows us to revise an investment strategy because you could invest at a loss in the first touch point or your first session, but you might make those you know the frequency is high enough that that might be a very solid strategy if you're looking more at CAC and LTV versus same session ROAS. I agree. Yeah. And I think with, I'm sorry, the, the P and L look when you're running a promotion and often I, in our companies, we probably do post promotion analysis pretty frequently with our RGM friends and such. You've got to look at the repeat as well as even subscription um, in some places now. So, you know, because that's so important from the calculation of why you're running these things. 
and I love sampling for our sna you know, for snacking products. I mean, it's it's an ideal spot for us. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to build on what Evelyn was saying. I mean, repeat purchase is often overlooked, and you know, so if we look at the the long term lifetime value and compare it to that you know, to the acquisition cost, that's going to help us truly scale our investment strategies and really think about how to grow more profitably as well. And you know, I think you know, you'll see a significant shift in the tactical mix um, as you start to look at LTV. You know. Um, and I think what's intriguing about retail media is that um, a lot of the retailers have the data. And as they start to, you know, to build their clean rooms, they're going to, come to be able to start sharing the LTV. And I think that will change how we invest at those retailers and not just, you know, within the digital portion of retail media, but also the in-store retail media piece. And then bringing together digital and in-store retail media will completely change in terms of how we acquire customers, where we acquire them. It'll help us optimize our profit pools as well. So I think that this will be another big driver of scaling retail media to the next level by looking at LTV beyond just the initial trial. So let's let's talk more about in-store retail media. Um, this has been an interesting er area, which um, it's still a very small sliver of ad spend, uh, less than 1% of total retail media ad spend. Um, I was at a conference two weeks ago where it was probably 50% of what was talked about. Um, so retailers are really focused on how do they uh, enter into this opportunity and, and brands want to understand how it works. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, but it's certainly a big opportunity. Um, In-store retail media, lots of digital surfaces. You know, you can have surfaces at the front of store, checkout aisle, smart carts, cooler doors uh, by the pharmacy, deli counter, right? So th these are the places where, where retailers are considering in-store media. Um, I haven't heard a lot from brands yet in terms of how they think about it. What are they excited about? Are there surfaces that maybe you think about for your brands, right? Because different surfaces might work better for your brands or portfolio of brands. So how are you all thinking about it? I think when you think, I'm sorry, go ahead, Emily. No, please go, please go. Uh, I think when you think of the future of the stores, you've got to think about the, the experience for shoppers. If you think about actually the, the world evolving with e-commerce and more and more click and collect and, and online delivery, the store needs to be a really great experience. And I think that I would like to think that starts with that before it gets to retail media network and how do we monetize it? And then, then the next piece and what we're thinking about, what does make sense for, and again back to some of the the comments earlier about iroas or, or roi is what is going to really drive us incremental value um in, in those actions some things i think are not as valuable and they've been around a long time and there's other things that could be monetized and i think we have to be interested we have to be great partners we got to think through these things for the future i think right now it's been a really interesting and kind of fun, like intellectually fun place to have conversation about the what is possible. I think right now, some of the what's possible conversations are probably a little bit ahead of the capabilities that exist to buy today. But I think it is one of those great spaces where as partners, we can really work together with our retail partners to say, what could this look like? And even thinking back to where digital retail media was, even four or five years ago, where a lot of the great interesting conversations were not about the capabilities that exist today, but how do we collectively and collaboratively build for what's possible for the future? And I feel like we're a little bit in that stage right now of how do we how do we understand what the retailers are trying to achieve and how do we how do we give feedback from a brand perspective of what would be interesting and what would we want to buy and invest in? But I think a really important piece is to not lose sight of the connectivity of digital and physical because many people, you know, data shows that so many people, the majority of people are on their phones and have their devices with them when they're shopping in a store. And I think that interplay between what's your digital experience and how does it work in concert with what's going on in store and what those opportunities are is a really interesting kind of intersection and one that I would love to be able to explore, but just haven't seen yet you know, something that I can buy right now necessarily. Yeah. So it's friction, it's not easy to buy and and uh, not easy to measure. So that is is a major inhibitor of investment at this moment. Is that fair to say? 
I think it's just yeah. there's the menu of capabilities is <laughs> still somewhat limited, right? So not necessarily even ease of buying, but there, you know, I think it's emerging. It feels like a very emerging channel right now of what even what are the actual offerings? What can you buy right now? Are some final thoughts on this no, topic? I was going to build on Emily said question. so. Yeah, no, I was going to build on Emily said. I mean, uh, you know, you and I have talked uh, in store retail media, Andrew, like, but the, the capabilities just aren't there, you know, the, the more like there's a lot of chatter about in-store retail media, but the capabilities don't exist or those that exist are not um, scalable necessarily. Right. And so the more I've been inquiring about the opportunities within in-store retail media, it, they're very cookie cutter options with really no ability to um, invest and measure. So I'd say, you know, standardization of measurement is lacking and also the the actual scalability of the uh, in-store retail media capability is lacking too. The, the one thing I would say is that, you know, people talk about in-store retail media within the four walls, but with shoppers becoming more hybrid shoppers now, it's almost like in-store retail media starts when you get into the lot. So how do you think about retail media beyond just the walls of the store and the point you're entering the parking lot? And what are all the different ways you can market to the consumer, you know, from the point that they interact with, you know, the retailer, all the way through checkout and what capabilities exist there. Yes, there are some, you know, um, you know, in-store coolers being branded, you know, there are um, self-checkout screens and all that, but how much of that is actually available today? Not much and where it is available, it's uh, far and few between and still being uh, tested. Final question here, we've got about a minute left. So if we can keep it to about 30 seconds, um, really quickly, future of retail media, which upcoming innovations do you see being the most transformative in the future? I'll tee up a couple of options. Generative AI gets a lot of discussion. Um, digitization of the store, store analytics. Um, what excites you the most as, as you start to look ahead to the future? Francesca, I know you have oh, an opinion I'll, on this I'll go with <laughs> analytics. You got to make it really easy. Uh, as things keep scaling, you've got to make it really easy to understand what performs and what best and where also the opportunities are. Emily? I agree. It's analytics, measurement innovation. <laughs> <laughs> because these have been said, I'll, I'll say on the AI front, I think it's such early days, but we talk a lot about personalization in, at scale and what enables personalization at scale to resonate with consumers. And I think there's a ton of potential and I'm excited to see how that helps us get away, getting away from needing to build thousands of campaigns and instead, you know, make it easier to, to be granular. Excellent. Well, Emily, Francesca, Paris, thank you so much for your excellent insights. Uh, this was fantastic. I think we got to go really deep. I hope uh, the audience appreciated uh, getting as deep as we did. Um, thank you to our audience for tuning in. And next up, we have another analyst-led panel, Generative AI in 2024 with Paul Verna. Join Paul by clicking on the tab below video that says next session. Um, while you wait for Paul's panel to begin, don't forget to check out our new networking feature on the left side navigation panel. Take your photo and upload it to our gallery when you can, where you can see other attendees, analysts, and presenters. Thank you so much. <laughs>